you, Dr. Lee and Dr. Hanauer. It's such an honor to be here on, with such a wonderful panel of speakers, and thank you to the audience for joining us today. So I will talk to you about the role of therapeutic drug monitoring. Here are my conflicts of interest and financial disclosures. So what I'd hope to review with you over the next 20 minutes or so is to give you a historical perspective on the role of TDM, or therapeutic drug monitoring in inflammatory bowel disease. I'd like for us to all understand the pharmacokinetics behind our therapies. We'll discuss reactive versus proactive therapeutic drug monitoring. And then we'll review a little bit of, about the assays and some of the clinical tools we could use for TDM. Now the concept of therapeutic drug monitoring is not new. For other clinical scenarios such as solid organ transplant, cyclosporin, tacrolimus is very frequently used and monitored in order to evaluate for efficacy and safety. The essence is that if there's high levels of the drug, of the drug concentration, then perhaps that leads to toxicity with lower levels associated with the lack of efficacy. There's a lot of interest for the role of TDM with the different bi uh, components and therapies that we have in inflammatory bowel disease from our immune modulators as well as our biologics. And there's a question of what role will this have with some of the newer therapies in the pipeline in IBD. So uh, we won't spend too much time in regards to therapeutic monitoring for our thiopurines, but you're very familiar with this. And this was a meta-analysis to basically demonstrate that higher 6 TGN levels, or thioguanine levels, greater than about 230 to 260 was associated with improved outcomes, higher likelihood for clinical remission. And based off of this, a great example of therapeutic drug monitoring comes with our thiopurines and evaluating the 6-TGN level. And from the screen, you can see that if there's absent levels of your 6-TGN, right, so thiopurines, uh, your prodrug, and now you have your metabolites, if there's an absence of levels, perhaps your patient's not even taking the medication. Now on the far right, you can see that if there's very high levels, and what we mean by this, about 450, 500, then perhaps there's an option or an opportunity to decrease the dose of your thiopurine. What about thiopurine with methotrexate? Well, we don't have much data in regards to the role of evaluating the metabolite or the component of the red blood cell methotrexate polyglutamate here. Mostly we have this evaluated in rheumatoid arthritis. And there you can see, based off of 13 studies, there was found to be higher levels of association with having the higher levels and disease activity improving with higher levels. Conversely, in inflammatory bowel disease, we actually see an inverse relationship, perhaps owing to the side effect uh, and the toxicity that comes with higher levels that relates to increased activity as well, or reported activity. So what about anti-tumor necrosis factor, our TNFs? Well, we know that therapeutic drug monitoring, I'm sure over many conferences, you've heard about the role of TDM, and I'd like to talk to you about why this is important. To begin with, there's no question that TDMs, or excuse me, that our anti-TNFs are very efficacious and improves outcomes for our patients. But the unfortunate part is that about 30% of our patients are primary non-responders to the TNF. Okay, we have about 40% who develop a loss of response, so a secondary loss of response. And we think these outcomes are related to the fact of the pharmacokinetics of our therapies, the drug clearance, the development of antibodies, immunogenicity. So these factors comes into play, which you've already heard from this morning's discussion in regards to the importance of perhaps even monitoring antibody levels and trough levels to be able to avoid some of this. We know that your response to your first anti-TNF is the best. So really it's important to optimize our therapies well in advance in order to avoid worsened outcomes. Mazur and uh, colleagues, they, said they were one of the first to show us the significance of basically evaluating trough levels and monitoring this for outcomes. So what happened was about 100 patients were followed. They would receive their infliximab. And here you can see that each time they would receive the trough levels as well as antibody levels were actually drawn. And from this, you can see that higher trough levels correlated with, positively with clinical remission as well as improvement in endoscopy. 
You've already seen this slide earlier, Act 1 and Act 2. So you can see from here based off of the quartiles. So now we're dividing our trough levels into four separate quartiles. And the higher quartiles of our drug concentration of infliximab at week 8 was associated with the best clinical outcomes. But I want to refer you to what's the smaller number below, where now you look at a trough level very high early on, but perhaps we could actually aim for a lower trough level later on, week 30, week 54, again suggesting that perhaps we need to monitor these levels very early on, optimize early on, and then perhaps we don't need to aim for such a high level throughout the rest of the, the time frame for that patient being on that respective treatment. Aside from improved clinical remission with higher trough levels, we also have seen a lower risk for colectomy, and this was one of your ARS questions. So there is and has been found to be a much lower risk for colectomy with detectable trough levels as opposed to higher rates with undetectable levels. I showed you the data for infliximab, but the same goes for adalimumab. And in fact, for adalimumab, perhaps our trough levels need to be aimed even a little bit higher. So on the prior slides that I showed you, this trough concentration was around 3 to 5, but perhaps here what we're seeing with the adalimumab data, the ability to achieve a higher trough level was associated with better mucosal healing. And from this, you can see, uh, as far as dividing into quartiles, something even higher than five and six, and perhaps we should aim for seven or eight as far as our goal for a trough concentration for adalimumab. We won't spend too much on the non-anti-TNFs other than to say that this concept is still applicable for our other therapies. Vetolizumab, we, uh, we can see that higher trough levels, again, better associated with clinical response as well as clinical remission. And I'll say that even at DDW last year for Ustekinab or Stellara, we saw the same association, better outcomes at week eight with a trough level of about five. You saw this slide earlier when Dr. Hanauer shared it with you in regards to the different factors. So we talked about the importance of having a good amount of drug available, but what factors actually impact its clearance or its metabolism? From this list, these are factors you're all very well aware of. High CRP, low albumin, body mass. But the one I want to highlight at the very top is the presence of antibodies, the development of immunogenicity, because we know that this is associated with the porous outcomes and clears the drug most rapidly, in fact, by about threefold decrease in drug availability with having uh, the antibodies to the respective drug on board. There is this concept of transient versus sustained antibodies. So when we talk about the impact of antibodies, this was studied already knowing that about 20% of patients develop antibodies uh, over time to their respective anti-TNF that they uh, are on. And from this, Niels Van Castile and colleagues were able to evaluate about 100 patients, 1,500 samples over a time frame. Each time they would come in for their infusion, they would have drug levels and antibodies body levels drawn, and among them, they were able to find that about 30% of patients actually lost antibodies over time. So they had antibodies and this reduced over time. This suggests that potentially there are some folks that have what's called transient antibodies. So not all antibodies may be as bad as we think. But we do know the component of sustained antibodies. Sustained antibodies are folks who have higher levels, as was mentioned earlier, levels greater than 10, for example, or early development of antibodies within a six-month time frame from the, from the start time or initiation of their therapies. So be cognizant of the sustained versus um, uh, transient antibody development. Then let's talk about fecal loss. Now this is a very important concept that, uh, that really highlights a few points for us. The fecal loss and the impact of this was studied to, uh, in, a, in mo uh, basically moderate to severe ulcerative sort of colitis patients over a two week time frame. Okay, so over two weeks, patients were uh, obtained, we obtained, they obtained fecal levels as well as serum levels. And the non-responders to infliximab was based on the fact of whether these patients required dose intensification or even cessation of their respective biologic, and in this case, it was infliximab. 
and you can see that the non-responders compared to the responders had a much higher level of fecal loss of infliximab early on, and at the end of the two-week study, they had a much lower level of the infliximab in serum. So when we talk about development of antibodies and we talk about how these medications are cleared, the anti-TNFs are cleared in our blood, we have to recognize that when there's low levels of drug in the body, there's a higher risk for antibody development. And so this, in a, particularly in a setting of severe colitis, we have to recognize that these patients that are hospitalized have high CRP, low albumin, these are factors we just talked about. Now they have high antibody development as well. Perhaps we should aim for a trough much higher and, and perhaps we should actually, rather than giving five mg per kg in a hospitalized patient, perhaps we should even do 10 mg per kg, recognizing this fecal loss. This is a phenomenon that really our rheumatology colleagues don't really have to deal with, but we do. So this is another argument for perhaps we should aim higher. This slide was already demonstrated to you. We spoke about the impact in, uh, of the antibodies, the immunogenicity, and now this slide is a reminder that combination therapy, we won't have the debate again, but combination therapy is associated with less antibodies as opposed to the monotherapy from the slides you can see here. And then there's this concept of reverting immunogenicity. Can we potentially, for someone who's on a biologic, an anti-TNF, can we potentially, as we see that they've developed antibodies, can we give them an immune modulator and revert this immunogenicity? Well, this was a very small retrospective five patients only study that actually said potentially we can. Potentially we can actually revert or decrease some of the antibodies and increase the trough level and improve the clinical response. The role of a combination therapy, when we talk about it for, uh, for reducing antibody development and also improving the drug concentration, this was studied previously and then also more recently additional abstracts have become available that actually suggest that immune modulators or thiopurin specifically in this situation, if you're giving it for, for uh, trying to help with reducing the risk for immunogenicity, perhaps we could aim for a lower target. So your 6-TGN as monotherapy, again, as my prior slide showed, was about 250. But perhaps we could go lower if we're going to use it as a concomitant uh, medication for reducing the risk for immunogenicity. And this study showed that perhaps levels of closer to about 125 was just as good. And really, from this study, higher levels may not even be necessary. So perhaps we could reduce some of that toxicity or the concerns or even the nausea, vomiting, et cetera, that comes with this with aiming a little bit lower and finding that, in fact, that's just as good. So then we talk about reactive versus proactive. That's why you're all here, and this is why the title of my talk was Reactive versus Proactive. You've all heard about reactive approach. I, I believe over, uh, over the years you've been hearing about this approach. This approach is basically becoming reactive after your patient develops a loss of response. The proactive approach is basically being very proactive about it even before your patient develops a loss of response. And from both of these categories or different styles, you can see regardless, there are reported improved outcomes as well as studies that say that it's cost efficacious to take either of these approaches, but just do something as far as monitoring your patients. This was a systematic studies, uh, a systematic review that evaluated the two approaches. So again, your reactive approach, you're waiting for your patient to first develop some form of symptoms, some form of loss of response and, uh, and, and or active inflammation when you scope them or uh, biochemical evidence of active disease. Okay, so the reactive approach is then you obtain drug levels, you check antibodies, and you act based upon those levels. The proactive approach where there's less data available on and most of that data is on the maintenance phase is saying no, we're not going to wait until our patients come with symptoms or with evidence of active disease, but rather we're going to start early, recognizing the concepts what we talked about already.
So when we talk about the reactive approach, Niels Van Castile Group, again, has a great algorithm for us to use this approach based off of, again, your patient was initially either doing well so uh, it has now a secondary loss of response because now they're developing active symptoms, or maybe perhaps they never were really doing well as soon as you started the therapy, but perhaps even being a primary non-responder. At this time, from this algorithm, you would see that you would need to obtain drug levels, drug concentration levels to evaluate your trough, and you will also determine your antibodies. So if there were a primary non-responder with antibodies, detectable antibodies as well, in these patients perhaps they're just going to be a primary non-responder to TNFs, to anti-TNFs, and in that situation you would consider out-of-class switch to a different category or class of biologic agents. Conversely, for those who initially had some response or you're just not, they're not feeling as well enough, for those secondary loss of response or a partial response, again, drawing your drug levels, evaluating, making sure that you have them in a good, uh, good therapeutic range or for that trough, as well as evaluate antibodies. And from this, you can see that if there's very high antibodies and you have a, a, a good trough level in these patients, perhaps they're going to respond to a TNF, but perhaps this TNF just didn't do it for them. And in this situation, you may also, if you've already uh, tried other TNFs, you may also need to at some point consider a switch to out of class. For both of these, I caution you. Okay, I told you earlier, not all antibodies are alike. But I also told, uh, am telling you that this wait and see approach could potentially be dangerous. Okay, so you're waiting and seeing, and in the meantime, there's always the risk that if you're waiting, watch, watchful waiting until your patient becomes symptomatic again, you're potentially losing about 30% of your patients because you did not optimize them in time, and now the immunogenicity cannot be overcome, and now there's more complications related to their disease course. So be careful with this approach, but this is an approach that we've been using ever since we've come to recognize the essence and importance of troughs and antibody levels. So what about the proactive approach? We spoke earlier about this treat to target. Can we start using the concept of treat to trough? Meaning can we aim for a therapeutic window, recognizing that for infliximab, perhaps we should have that range of three to seven or five to 10, and maybe even a little bit higher for adalimumab. Maybe we should aim for this and base our management strategies early on. So treat to trough, find that, find that sweet spot for recognizing what works for that, your patient and, and building off of that. There really isn't, I mean, there's a discussion of maybe high levels can lead to toxicity and maybe we could actually decrease levels of our TNFs based off of this, uh, their, the trough that we obtain. Well, we haven't really seen, not that I'm aware of, any good data to say that high level, super therapeutic levels of our anti-TNFs leads to toxicity, but more importantly, it's these lower concentrations that if early on we can optimize, then perhaps we're decreasing the risk for loss of response and poorer outcomes, as well as decreasing the risk for developing antibodies because, again, if there's a large amount of fecal clearance or loss, drug uh, loss altogether or clearance of the, of the therapies, now the patient is at a higher risk for developing antibodies. So this was also, this slide was also shown earlier too, demonstrating that this concept of proactive monitoring, actually we've done it, we've been doing it in, in a sense of, uh, we could go back and see the importance of proactive monitoring. From this uh, slide that was also previously shown to you, having a good trough level, so for infliximab greater than three and a half, you're two times more likely to have a sustained response at the end of the year again, emphasizing the importance of early on recognizing what your trough level is and then working off of that. We also know that having an effective or good therapeutic range of your trough is important and it helps and is associated with short-term mucosal healing. From this, you can see that these levels, even at week six, is important but then you also have your week 14. And in fact, at week six, you can see from this slide that again, your trough is probably a little bit, your goal trough probably may be even a little bit higher early on, similar to the act one and act two studies I showed to you earlier in regards to what your goal should be for that trough, potentially even as early as week six. 
and then at Elimimab, we say forget the 14 and forget the 6. Maybe we should even look at week 4. So this was a study to basically demonstrate the importance for adalimumab for being very proactive in recognizing what your target, what your trough is. And in this, you can see that at levels of less than 5, your patients were at much higher risk for development of antibodies. And you can see the other outcomes listed below here. But again, potentially for adalimumab more than for infliximab, we should aim for a much higher, not, uh, not only a higher trough, but then also we should evaluate this much sooner for our patients. So then we say, okay, fine. We understand trough level is important. We understand antibodies are important. You're telling me I need to check this, but why proactively still? You're still not buying it, huh? Okay, so, so why proactively? Well, from this study, this was a, this was a good study initially to, uh, to evaluate just that. Do I really need to be as proactive as you're asking me to be, or can I be reactive? And so Adam Shevitz uh, was the, uh, the senior author in this study. This was a study to basically evaluate exactly what the question you have for me. Why proactive? Okay, so this was two arms. His group of patients were patients that were in clinical remission for at least about a year, and he took those patients and he said, we're going to be very proactive and I'm going to start optimizing your treatment. So I'm going to go for a goal of five to 10 for trough, for infliximab, and if you are not within that range, we'll fix it and optimize it. His colleagues in the same practice said, we don't believe you, we're gonna do it our way, we'll do the reactive way. If our patients need it, we'll do it based off of symptoms. Okay, and you can see here that compared to his colleagues, his results are as follows. So his patients were more likely to remain on infliximab up to a five-year time frame that was evaluated as opposed to his colleagues after one year. So I'm gonna highlight this green, is it green? This green line for you, okay? And the reason this is important is because now I'm gonna show you another study which you have all heard of potentially, Taxid. Okay, so the TAXIT study was evaluating very similar to what the prior study showed, which was saying, okay, should we really do proactive monitoring? Okay, so, so the TAXIT was designed in a way where we now are saying perhaps TAXIT was a negative study. And I'm going to say maybe it wasn't a negative study, and we're going to talk about the results of this. TAXIT was defined where the patients were, were collected, and that these patients, about 200 and some patients were collected, and all patients coming in with Crohn's, oral cervical colitis, all patients initially were optimized. Okay, so no pro, don't forget proactive, reactive, all patients were optimized for a range of three to seven. The prior study was five to 10 for TROP. These all patients were, were, ran, uh, were optimized. So if you had really high doses, we brought you down. If you had really low doses, we brought up your infliximab. Then, and only after then, were these patients randomized into the maintenance phase. So then there were your two arms. There was the reactive phase or, or group, and here you can see there was about, well, uh, about 123 patients in the reactive, and you had your, your optimized proactive group. And these are patients who very actively levels were checked, okay? From this, you can see that for Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, your results are as follows. For Crohn's disease, you were able to actually capture an additional 15 to 20 percent of your patients who were, had a clinical response, and now you've brought them to clinical remission. And you could also see that your CRP levels actually decline among the proactive monitoring group, the optimized group. You did not see those results in ulcerative colitis, but in ulcerative colitis, even early on, about 90% were already in remission. Now, the problem with this study, and the reason it was considered, again, as a negative study was because their primary endpoint was clinical remission at one year. In the prior study I showed you with that green line, you started seeing that differentiation after one year, where about 90% of Adam's patients were continuing to remain on the therapy, but about 50% of those who were not dose optimized within a, after a year slowly started getting off of therapy or had to change therapy or intensify therapy, right? So, so that prior study following beyond a year 
was actually where we would see potentially more differences. And even from this, you can see that these curves start separating after a year. Again, potentially saying if we evaluated longer, maybe we would have actually seen that difference. So I don't know if it was a true negative study. Also, the goals, the trough goals were different. Three to seven in this study versus five to 10 is also another component you need to be cognizant of. But regardless, the taxa did have successful secondary endpoints that were more in alignment for favoring proactive monitoring. And here, part of your ARS questions as well, there was less need for rescue therapy with the proactive group, as well as you were able to have effective tr uh, trough concentrations and fewer infusion reactions. ARS question right there, okay? Costs, similar. Whether you clinically monitored and adjusted or concentration, it was similar. More recently, hot after press, just uh, recently there was another study saying, okay, we still don't buy it. Reactive, proactive, which one do you want? And this was a retrospective study of two, uh, of, of two different types of practices again. The reactive practice as well as the proactive practice, evaluating treatment failure, surgeries, hospitalizations, infusion reactions, as well as antibodies. And from this, the proactive group seemed to do better, long-term outcomes, now beyond a year. Again, we have to be, remember this. So beyond a year, treatment failure was less among the proactive arm, as well as less risk for surgeries, hospitalizations, antibody development, okay? Because now, remember, you have more drug around, so that risk for antibody development potentially decreases, as well as serious infusion reactions. So you're still not buying it. Okay, so why proactive? Why proactive? Well, this is a list of different studies, and I refer you to the respective studies below, but to again highlight potentially, aside from improving outcomes, aside from being cost efficacious, aside from knowing what true therapeutic window we should tailor and optimize our treatments for, there's other options with proactive monitoring. There's this potential for even de-escalation of supra therapeutic drugs, uh, and so this is, is something that's still being evaluated, but among the taxa, that study I just told you about, about 27% of patients in taxa, remember I told you there are some who actually we reduced their level, uh, their uh, their therapies, right? If so, if they were, if they had high concentrations beyond three to seven, we actually decreased their infliximab level, and we saw that there was no negative impact among those patients in regards to remission, clinical remission. 15% of patients that either stopped or de-escalated infliximab in another study also did not have a negative impact. Okay, so so. Here's another study, 90% of patients who had a, th a good therapeutic level of, of, of uh, infliximab trough that were, were again able to de-escalate to that range, that sweet spot of three to seven, again did well up to close to a year. So overall, we have found that if we decrease our levels based on the trough, this was cost efficacious and much more superior this versus this empiric, let's increase, let's decrease based on how you're feeling or what your CRP is. What about de-escalation of your immune modulator? Well, we had this discussion already, but from de-escalation of your immune modulator, what I early on want to emphasize is if you're going to consider de-escalation or even taking off the immune modulator from, uh, from your patient's medicine cabinet, I want you to at least practice TDM. At least know what trough you're starting with and whether or not it's a good time. And based off of that, you can see that if your trough level was greater than five, then really there was no increased risk for having poorer outcomes or loss of remission if you take off the immune modulator. So if you're going to de-escalate, at least first know where you're starting at and thereafter make sure you do close PK monitoring with checking drug and antibody levels. And this is based based on the concept that really after six months, combination therapy, there's really a question of whether that's necessary or not even, but that's uh, to follow.
what about taking off your anti-TNF? Again, this is definitely not a debate I want to go with any of my colleagues here on the panel up against, but we're not there other than to say that this should be case by case. But what I do want to highlight is drug level monitoring and antibody monitoring is especially important for your patients who have been on a drug holiday. Okay, so they, for financial reasons, personal choice, et cetera, they went off of therapy and now they're coming back to start therapy. After their first infusion, it's a really good time to check your drug concentration and antibody level because that's most predictive of who's going to develop that infusion reaction we warn our patients about, as well as we know it improves outcomes if we know where we're starting at. So just a few slides in regards to biologic assays currently available. From this, you can see that there's so many assays and you have to, most importantly, I want you to be aware of which assay you're using. Recognize that it's a cost issue, it's a time issue, your insurance companies may not pay for it, et cetera, et cetera. So we've all come across these issues with our assays. But the most important one that I want to uh, remind you about is being cognizant of whether it's a drug tolerant assay or not, right? So in, in a sense of can you check your antibody levels as well as your drug levels or not? And so be aware of the drug, uh, the drug tolerant one, which is the second column on the right. But here are your different assays and be familiar with which one your institution, clinic, or hospital utilizes to know how to inter interpret the results from these assays. Again, highlighting and reminding you not all antibodies are alike based on these assays as well. To end with, there's just a few more slides. When should we perform TDM? We're still not there quite yet to be able to tell you one way or another. We certainly have different tools that can be utilized. The Bridge app was uh, by Gill's team uh, who basically allows for a, on a smartphone as well as on a computer, you plug in the drug level, you plug in the antibody level, you plug in some details and information, and it gives you a suggested algorithm of how to manage your patients. Okay, there's this dashboard that Marla has, uh, is working on currently to be able to evaluate and see if, uh, if maybe we could really tailor and personalize our therapies. And there's also uh, efforts being made of, of actual on-site testing where we could do a quick pinprick in clinic and say, this is your level, this is what we're going to do, boom, just like that. In an ideal world, we want that to be only a few cents and we could really optimize our approach for our patients. Everyone loves the guidelines. I don't know, um, we don't really love it, but we know as Miguel reminded us, we need it. And these are the guidelines that were just recently introduced by the AGA. I am um, going to put these guidelines up because you may still have trouble even obtaining drug and antibody levels on your patients. If you're going to try to do drug, uh, therapeutic drug monitoring, you could base it on these guidelines and remind your insurance companies that at least reactive is certainly recommended and for proactive, the AGA doesn't say pro or against, so really that's still up for debate. But this was just published, uh, uh, I believe, a few weeks ago uh, in the guidelines. So to summarize, first of all, I wanted to say uh, and remind us all that therapeutic monitoring for biologics is much more complex than our immune modulators. The measurable drug concentrations is very important. And again, for infliximab, we say about five. For adalimumab, about seven and a half or even higher. And I will say this is based on certain types of phenotype. For perianal fistulizing disease, there's even some talk that maybe we should aim closer to 15 or 20 for infliximab. So just recognize what phenotype you're discussing when you're talking about your trough levels. We know that detectable antibodies is associated with decreased efficacy. We know that therapeutic monitoring basically results in improved outcomes. So at least try the reactive. If you're not doing it already, practice it. It's important. But I'm going to encourage you that maybe at some point as a community, we could not only practice treat to target, but treat to trough as well. And we could practice that concept of proactive monitoring early on. I thank you for your attention.